As gamers, we tend to have very specific ideas about the sorts of times, places, and events in effect in the games we play. We know, for instance, when playing the sort of medieval fantasy style game represented by Dungeons and Dragons, Pathfinder, and many of their derivatives, that we shouldn't really be seeing things like tanks, automobiles, calculators, electric lights, or telephones. Sure, there are genres of games that might allow for all those things within the implied game world, and even specific settings within various core game systems that make room for them. But in the core games and the worlds they pretend to be set in, those sorts of things are beyond the scope of the medieval world they assume. When we find items like this out of their proper time frame, we call them anachronisms. They don't fit where and when they are. They are chronologically out of place. The word anachronism itself is made up of two Greek words, chronos meaning time, and the prefix ana meaning up, back, or again. It was first used in the 17th century to refer, very specifically, to something that had been given a date much earlier than was correct. It had been back-timed. For example, if you thought the word anachronism was first coined and used by the ancient Greeks, that would be an anachronism. There used to be a related word, perichronism, that meant you dated something later than was appropriate, like misremembering the end of World War II as 1950 instead of 1945. Apparently it wasn't a good enough word though, and dropped out of usage fairly quickly until anachronism covered pretty much any case of something being assigned an incorrect date. Then it morphed a bit more, until it also meant any object or person out of its proper time. You'd no more accept a laser gun as being appropriate to an age of castles and knights than you would a live stegosaurus running rampant in the lord's bedchambers. Both seem wrong and out of place, and you'd have good reason to complain if this sort of thing happened in a game you thought was supposed to be strictly medieval in nature. Although, both have happened in various adventures from D&D. Why? Well, because it's cool. At least for a little while. Which brings us to our point. The medieval period, or Middle Ages if you prefer, lasted, at least according to Earth history, from the 5th to the 15th centuries, 400 CE to 1499 CE, roughly. From the fall of the Western Roman Empire to the transition to the Renaissance and the Age of Discovery. In Europe. Which is a whole kettle of fish we'll deal with at a future date. At any rate, that seems like a pretty clear-cut time frame from which to take our inspiration for our various games. It's a big swath of time with pretty fuzzy endpoints, granted. But there are clearly things considered outside that time frame, and things which are obviously inside that time frame. So why then, keeping that time frame in mind, when we think about and imagine the sorts of adventures we can have in a ship in D&D and related games, do we almost invariably imagine the adventures of an age almost 100 years later than the medieval period? There's swashbuckling and pirates and cannon and vast sails and voyages of discovery and exploration and treasure and trade and a whole host of other things that even if we stretch time as much as we can, were historically only just barely happening by the time we get out of the imaginary Middle Ages we're playing in. Even worse, the age we particularly picture, for most of us, is a very brief period of history set almost 300 years after a whole new age had begun, and which only lasted roughly 100 years before it too was overtaken by an entirely new new age, both at sea and on land. And word to the wise, if what you want is to know a bit about what happened during the Middle Ages in terms of navigating and getting around the world by sea, take a look back in our archive and find our three-part series on sailing which includes the episodes Carrick, Dead Reckoning, and Water Clock before you listen to this one. Because in this one, we're setting sail for a destination that was opened up by that series of episodes and the things that happened there. And to get there, we're going to tell you the answer to the question we just asked. The reason we have a whole different period of sailing adventures than the Middle Ages might allow is the same reason lasers and dinosaurs crop up too. The age of sail is way too cool to leave out. This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Before we get to the age of sail, 
we have to back up a bit to the age of not sail and discuss one of the most fundamental of ship designs, a design so thoroughly perfected and understood that it was the one and only premier design for much of the world, for much of history. Certainly more history than even sailing ships were around for. In the ancient world, if you wanted to go trading or fighting or even just out on a pleasure cruise, say up and down the Nile, there was only one sort of ship to do it on for your rich and famous godlike ruler. Developed as a natural extension of the basic principles outlined by the one-man canoe, the galley was the favorite ship design of anyone who was anyone or wanted to be anyone in ancient Egypt. Around the 3rd millennium BCE, the Egyptians were already sending what were essentially huge canoes rowed by multiple people at once up and down the coast, raiding, trading, and taking slaves. These early galleys were powered by as many as 30 men, all sitting in a row along the hull and rowing away. There was some speculation that a few of these early designs had a single sail mounted on a single mast, but these early sails were only good if the wind happened to be blowing in the direction you wanted to go. There was no maneuverability while under wind power and no way to change directions. These early sails were completely secondary to the main motive force of human rowing. Now, you may be familiar with the basic arrangement of a galley. Possibly you have seen films in the sword and sandal genre. Typically, some great hero, your Hercules or your Jasons, for instance, because early Greek mythology gets a lot more respect than early Egyptian mythology, go off on an incredible journey in which they are variously attacked by giant stop-motion monsters. Usually they travel by boat, and also usually by the end of the journey there are far fewer crew left than when they started. They're called sword and sandal movies for the obvious reason that almost everyone is kitted out with swords and a pair of ancient sandals, and not much else. Usually there is an evil magician around somewhere, as well as a beautiful love interest for the main hero. In any case, you know what a galley looks like because that's mostly what they sailed around on in these sorts of movies. Except you'll notice that a lot of the time, the hero's ship doesn't appear to be crewed properly. There's a lot of fussing about with sails and rigging when there shouldn't be. But these old movies make it seem like only the bad guys really had slaves doing the job of rowing. So much for historical accuracy. So up and down the rivers, out across the Mediterranean, and all over the various coasts, you could find all sorts of versions of the galley underway doing whatever it was they did, all being run by a number of different folks from different kingdoms. Which was kind of a problem. See, if you were a coastal city resident, for instance, you wouldn't really be able to tell if the fleet of galleys coming across the bay toward your town was there to trade or to raid. It wasn't until they got ashore that you knew which was about to happen. Any given galley could be on any one of several missions, depending on how they felt on the day. They all pretty much looked the same. And then, in the 8th century BCE, the Egyptians decided to be lots more clear about what their galleys were up to, and started fitting rams to the front of the ones they intended to attack people with. Now, it was really obvious when certain vessels were up to no good. Depending on your point of view, of course, brave sailing lads to the home team, black-hearted raiders to everybody else. These galleys were used to ram and disable ships at sea, so the goods they carried could be taken should the occasion present itself. Mostly, though, military galleys were used to transport troops to the location of land battles rather than fighting at sea. Until 1175 BCE, when the Egyptians took part in the first recorded naval battle against the Sea Peoples. No one knows now who the Sea Peoples were, really. They seem to be made up of a number of different civilizations who banded together for mutual benefit. But wherever they came from, they'd been sailing around the Mediterranean for years, making a nuisance of themselves, raiding various coastal cities and moving into the neighborhoods, regardless of who they belonged to originally. Eventually, this annoyed Egypt's Ramses III so much that he put together a naval force to complement his land force, and went out to make it clear to them that he didn't care who they were, they couldn't just go around squatting in people's houses, even if they had killed all those people off first. When the Sea People's forces split up into land and sea units, and the sea units tried to sail up the Nile in a coordinated attack, Ramsey's ships were waiting for them there and wiped them out. Having learned nothing, the Sea Peoples tried the exact same thing again a couple of years later with the same result. And then, Ramses III, being a faster learner than the Sea Peoples, posted coastal watchers 
and ambushed the Sea People's fleets with a purpose-built fleet of his own when they tried the exact same trick for a third time. Except this time, Ramses had had enough, sunk their ships, and dragged their men ashore where each and every one of them was executed just to drive the point home, as it were. Hash finally settled, the naval campaign ended 3-0 in favor of the Egyptians. From that point in 1175 BCE onward, naval combat became a regular thing. No army looking to defend or capture land did so without some sort of naval presence, and they all used galleys of one sort or another as their main warship. The Greeks, based on what was probably the Phoenician design at first, used and improved a galley with two rows of rowers, one atop the other, called a bireme, meaning two oars. The Romans, knowing a good thing when they saw it, improved on that design with a trireme, three rows of rowers. All of these developments were intended to make the galleys faster and more maneuverable, but it was soon discovered that there was an upper limit to how much could be done. For one thing, more than three rows were impractical and complicated ship design to such a degree that more was lost by trying to accommodate it than was gained in improvement. And so, their things more or less stayed for many years. How many years? Well, to answer that question, we have to go all the way from 1175 BCE to 1571 CE. That's right, over 2700 years. From the end of the Bronze Age, through the Iron Age, through ancient history in the Middle Ages in which D&D is sort of set, and right out into the middle of the Renaissance. That's how long the galley remained THE fighting ship in all the navies of the world. If you wanted to have a fight with anyone, anywhere, you had to row your way there in a ship whose basic structure was first laid down by the ancient Egyptians. It's an amazing track record of successful design. But it all came to an end in 1571, at the Battle of Lepanto. The Ottoman Empire had been expanding throughout the known world for several years. Not only were they a powerful force on land, but their navy was incredibly effective in the Mediterranean Sea as well. In fact, the Ottomans hadn't lost a naval battle since the 15th century, and this, combined with their successes elsewhere in the world, was making the various powers of Europe very nervous indeed. Now, there's a lot to unpack regarding the Ottomans, their conquests and expansion, and the goings-on in Europe leading up to the Battle of Lepanto. It's all very interesting stuff, really, but it isn't something we have the time and wherewithal to go into, even if this were an episode just about the Ottomans. We've touched on them in various episodes before, but for now, let's just say they were a big scary threat, and much of the world was very concerned about them just taking over everything, because they looked almost unstoppable. Which is why Pope Pius V put together a group of heroes and called them the Holy League. Well, not heroes yet, of course but it was certainly a collection of some of the most Catholic maritime states along the Mediterranean, gathered with an eye to stopping the Ottoman Empire's advances. The Pope assembled all his papal states, along with Naples, Sicily, Habsburg, Spain, the republics of Venice and Genoa, the Knights of Malta, and the duchies of Tuscany, Savoy, Urbino, and Parma. In all, there were over 200 galleys, 100 assorted other ships, 50,000 infantry, 4,500 cavalry, and sufficient artillery to make it all go pop. In all, the Battle of Lepanto would be the largest naval battle seen in at least a thousand years, eventually involving more than 400 warships, all fighting in close quarters. East sailed the Holy League out of Sicily. West sailed the Ottoman Empire out of their naval base in Lepanto, commanded by Ottoman Admiral Ali Pasha. The League was commanded by Spanish Admiral John of Austria, half-brother of King Philip II himself, who financed most of the Holy League. The two forces met in the Gulf of Patras, near the entrance to the Gulf of Corinth in Greece. Now, you might picture in your head the sort of naval battle we talked about earlier with cannons and tall ships and buckswashling galore. Nothing could be further from the truth. First, remember we're still talking about galleys, which means a lot of rowing around trying to get into position. Into position for what? Why, for hand-to-hand -hand fighting, of course. Sure, there were guns, but the Holy League had them all, and they were basically just muskets and long guns. What cannon there was were hard to use and very slow to reload. The Ottomans, on the other hand, brought their best composite bowmen, and, lest you think the matchup unfair, 
Remember, the Ottomans had been busy conquering things with these sorts of weapons for ages. They might not put as big a hole in you as a hit by a musket, but they could fire more frequently. It's sort of a toss-up, really. Both sides formed into a line of battle, which was the hot new tactic of the day. Prior to line of battle, ships would sail directly at each other independently for individual combat. Now, ships sailed together in a line, supporting each other until literal contact with the enemy was made, at which point the fighting would ensue. It was reported by some observers that when the two fleets met, you could walk from ship to ship across the battlefield, fighting all the way. During the fighting, the Ottoman flagship with Ali Pasha aboard crashed so hard into John of Austria's flagship Rial that it embedded itself four rowing benches deep. Pasha and his crew leapt aboard the Rial amid the confusion, engaged the crew in hand-to-hand fighting, and nearly took the Rial before another galley from the Holy League was able to mount a defense from the other side of the ship, drive the Ottomans back across the decks of both ships, and finally take the Ottoman flagship. In so doing, they killed everyone on board the Ottoman ship, including Ali Pasha. In another part of the battle, through a bungled, possibly treacherous misplacement of one group of Holy League ships, The Ottomans were able to fight through a group of 15 enemy ships, eventually boarding and capturing the flag of the Knights of Malta before finally being driven back. Elsewhere on the battle line, Ottoman ships were captured and the enslaved Christian rowers set free to join the fighting against yet more Ottoman vessels. By the end of the day, though, the Ottoman troops ran out of weapons and were reduced to throwing oranges and lemons, much to the amusement of their Christian adversaries. The battle was over, and the Holy League had won. 30,000 Ottomans were killed to the Holy League's 7,500. The Holy League victory did two things. On the one hand, it marked the beginning of the Ottoman decline and the end of their empire's westward expansion. From that point on, the Mediterranean was divided in half, Europe in the west and Turks in the east. Neither side gained any ground after that, but the Holy League had finally shown the Ottomans could be beat. From there, it was just a matter of time. The second thing the Battle of Lepanto did was mark the beginning of the Age of Sail. Never again would a naval battle be fought that was made up entirely of ore-powered ships. Gradually, more and more cannons were being added to ships, and the galley was ill-equipped to handle the extra weight, which sacrificed speed and maneuverability without gaining much in offensive capability. Along the way, improvements were being made in the design of sails, meaning that sailing ships were swiftly becoming more maneuverable and faster at even larger sizes than the galley, and could therefore handle having even more cannon mounted. As sailing ships and heavy cannon became part of naval combat, the line of battle tactic was gradually refined until ships could stand off from each other firing cannon broadside at the enemy under covering fire from the rest of the line. This proved so effective that the new galleon ships steadily replaced the old galley as the preferred fleet element. The age of sail had begun. By the mid-18th century, things were in full swing. Sailing ships were huge and complex. Millions of dollars in trade occurred on an almost weekly basis with cargoes of spices, plants, and people crossing the Atlantic and Pacific every day. Hundreds of thousands of men were aboard ships somewhere in the world at any given time. Voyages of discovery, both scientific and political, were underway, and great naval powers plied the waves both enforcing their empires and adding to them. A new golden age of sail was underway, marked by British victories over the Spanish Armada. And it would last, at best, 75 years at the outside, before the age of sail, golden or not, came to an end forever. On March 8, 1872, terrible things were happening. The United States of America was in the throes of a civil war, and it's nearly impossible to say anything about the scope of that war and what it meant to the nation and its people without engaging in some form of cliché that you'll have heard a thousand times before. So we won't. Instead, we'll just say that things were really messed up, and it would be some time before anyone could even begin to work it all out. A process still underway to this day. Near Norfolk, Virginia, was a place called Hampton Roads, just where two rivers run into the James River at Chesapeake Bay. 
A fleet of Union ships were engaged in blockading Confederate Virginia, preventing any international aid from reaching its ports. The Confederates, as you can imagine, didn't like this much, but they'd had little success in doing anything about it. The Union Navy had five ships on station enforcing the blockade. The Sloop Cumberland and the Frigate Congress were anchored in the channel. Two steam frigates, the Roanoke and the Minnesota, and the sail frigate St. Lawrence were at nearby Fort Monroe. But when the Confederate ship CSS Virginia and a small complement of supporting ships was spotted on the morning of March 8th, all three set sail to intercept and promptly ran aground, effectively taking them out of the ensuing battle. Opening shots were exchanged between various support ships, but the Virginia just kept coming, not firing at all until she was in very, very close range to the Cumberland. Both Cumberland and Congress fired on Virginia to no effect. The shots just bounced off her hull. Using the attached ram, Virginia rammed Cumberland below the waterline and started her sinking, almost taking Virginia with her thanks to the force of the strike. When Virginia turned to attack Congress, her captain, having seen what happened to Cumberland, ran her aground to prevent her sinking. Eventually, when Virginia had been joined by other Confederate ships in the attack on Congress, the captain and crew surrendered and were removed from the badly damaged ship. Now, if you're having trouble placing the CSS Virginia in your memory of vague facts from the Civil War, it's because you know her under another name. And while this battle was the start of things, it wasn't until the next day's battle that things really came to a head and changed sailing and naval combat forever. See, the reason those shots bounced off Virginia's hull without doing much damage was because the Virginia was built using the steam engines and the hull from a former ship originally sunk by the Union Navy to prevent her capture at the start of the war. And the very next day, at Hampton Roads, the Union would send a ship called the Monitor to try once again to sink what used to be the Merrimack in the first ever Battle of the Ironclads, which convinced every navy in the world that steam-powered iron and steel armored ships was the way of the future and ended the Age of Sail. This episode of GM Word of the Week is brought to you by the kind contributions of our patrons on Patreon. If you've enjoyed this episode, and we hope you have, perhaps you'll consider joining the Patreon and making whatever contribution you feel comfortable making. You can find it by going to gmwordoftheweek.com and clicking the yellow banner at the top of any pages you find within. In return, transcript and early episode releases can be yours, among other things. If you're interested in finding out more about what things were like during the Golden Age of Sail, this episode was inspired in part by Sons of the Waves, the common seaman in the Heroic Age of Sail by Stephen Taylor, which relies heavily on the writings of actual sailors at the time, an Amazon link to which you can find in our show notes. This episode was researched, written, and produced by Brian Casey, who is not really much of a sailor himself, but enjoys a good sea adventure. Music is provided by Blue Dot Sessions and Epidemic Sound. I can't control the wind, but I can adjust the sails.